You will never be alive again, never rise from the snow. 28 bayonet, five fire wounds, a bitter new garment I sewed for my friend. It does love, does love blood, the Russian earth. This is from Anna Akhmatova. Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 187. The Russian Civil War, the end. Last time we covered the White Army surge and subsequent fading from the picture. Today we will cover the destruction of the AFSR, also known as the Armed Forces of Southern Russia, led first by Anton Denikin, then Pyotr Wrangel. We're heading back to 1920, which is the year of the last gasp of the White Army. By this time, the Red Army was so superior in numbers that whenever the Whites attempted an advance, they were always flanked or attacked from the sides. They had little choice to but to retreat, which they did into the Crimea. A military man would tell you that this was a brilliant plan, as the roads into the Crimea from Ukraine and Russia were very narrow and easily defensible. The problem was... The White Army was running out of supplies, fighting men, and allies. The British and the French were wary of helping as they thought that any aid would eventually be wasted and put into the hands of the Bolsheviks. The only hope the AFSR had was another front in the war, a front that was Poland. By this time, Trotsky and Lenin thought that they had the civil war in hand and that they only needed to keep pressing on and they would eventually win out. They were in a mindset that since victory was in reach, why not go for the ultimate goal, which was to spread communism throughout Europe. Their natural target was Warsaw. From there, they could head towards Berlin, which was in turmoil post-Versailles Treaty, and from there, Paris, and then London. In the early stages of the Polish-Soviet War, which lasted between February 1919 in March 1921, the Red Army pushed into Poland, sweeping through their defenses with ferocity. That is, until the Battle of Warsaw, which began on August 12, 1920. Mikhail Tukhachevsky and Semyon Bodiani led the Red Forces, which smashed their way through Ukraine, Belarus, and eventually into Poland. Tukhachevsky planned on encircling Warsaw, just as Ivan Peskevich had done in 1831 when his army crushed the Polish uprising. For all intents and purposes, the plan was a sound one and should have ended with a resounding victory for the Bolsheviks. Instead, in what is known in history as the miracle on the Vistula, the Polish army defeated the Reds. The victory was so devastating that within months, the Soviet Union was forced to sign an armistice known as the Peace of Riga in March of 1921. Historians have argued about who was to blame for this loss. Some blame Joseph Stalin, who then blamed Tukhachevsky, which of course cost him his life during the military purges of the 1930s. Others blame Central Command, who removed tens of thousands of men from the Polish front to shore up the Crimean side of the Civil War, something that the Whites did not want. But likely, this was a combination of events that gave the win to the Poles. What is undeniable is that the miracle on the Vistula was a seminal moment in world history as it halted the communist movement into Europe. It's really hard to underestimate the ramifications of this event as Europe was in turmoil post-World War I and it would be hard to tell if in fact the Bolshevik Revolution would have succeeded in advancing into Germany and beyond. In Crimea, with the war against Poland winding down and now looking to be unwinnable, Trotsky and Lenin set their eyes on destroying the last of their white opposition. The Soviet leaders made a deal with the Black Army of Nestor Makhno, who smashed into the White Army's flank, pushing them out of Ukraine. This deal was to be as worthless as the paper it was written on. As soon as the whites were no longer a threat, the Bolsheviks betrayed the blacks and destroyed them. The Red Army pushed through northern Crimea throughout 1920, culminating in the siege of Perekop. The Bolsheviks, under the command of Mikhail Frunz, 
advanced steadily against the white Russian army of General Pyotr Wrangel. With all lost, the only thing left was to evacuate and leave Russia for good. The ensuing panic was reminiscent of the evacuation of Saigon at the end of the Vietnam War. Soviet writer Konstantin Paustovsky gave a haunting description of the last moments of the evacuation of Crimea in November of 1920. And I quote, Gaping mouths, torn open by cries for help, eyes bulging from their sockets, faces livid and deeply etched by fear of death, of people who could see nothing but the one blinding terrible sight, rickety ships gangplanks, with handrails snapping under the weight of human bodies, soldiers' rifle butts crashing down overhead, mothers stretching up their arms to lift their children above the demented human herd, People were senselessly destroying each other, preventing even those who reached the gangway from saving themselves. The moment anyone gained a hold on the plank or the rail, hands grabbed and clutched at him. Clusters of bodies hung on him. Ships listed under the weight of people clinging to the deck rails. Ships sailed away without stowing the gangplanks, which slid into the sea with people still clinging to them. It was impossible to listen to the cries, curses, and wails of those left on the quayside, parted from their families. For those who did not get on the ships, their fate was already set. The Bolshevik army showed no mercy. Those left in Sevastopol, some 50,000 men, women, and children were slaughtered. It was a harsh reality that Mother Russia, home of the Tsars, the Boyars, the Russian Orthodox Church, was no longer there. It was now firmly in the hands of the Bolsheviks. How could this have gone all wrong? Mikhail Bulkakov, in his play Flight, put it best when he writes of a discussion between two white officers on a ship heading away from Sevastopol. Quote, What do you see out there? Ship after ship, steaming away, the decks filled with defeated men. It's over. It's the end of the road. Everything, everybody, smashed to pieces for once and for all. And you know what the problem's been? We've all been play-acting. Everybody except the Bolsheviks. Because they knew exactly what they wanted all along. Boy, was that a profound comment at the end, which I need to repeat, quote, everybody except the Bolsheviks, because they knew exactly what they wanted all along. Lenin wasn't shy about using terror or any other means of winning, because he knew what he wanted. The whites weren't sure if they wanted the Tsar back or some other form of autocracy, or maybe even democracy. They never had a firm grip on what the end game was. They were all about being against the Bolsheviks, which in the end was a sure way to defeat. In the East, the war was not going very well for the opposition. Their followers headed into Manchuria, where many loyalists went, including the priest that I knew well in my childhood, Father Renikensi. He told me of the harsh conditions he and thousands of others had to face to get away from the wrath of the Bolsheviks. Interestingly, I became aware of a book written by listener Lenore Sisserman entitled Mitya's Harbin, Majesty and Menace, which talks about the real-life travels through China post-revolution. And I found this out when she posted on our Facebook page, The Russian World of History Facebook, kind of fan club, you might say. The Civil War was not over in 1921, as there were sporadic battles in the South, mainly from Islamic rebels, really had no great affinity for the godless Bolsheviks. Still, by the end of 1922, there were only small pockets of resistance, all of whom would be crushed without mercy. In his book entitled The Russian Civil War 1918 to 1922, author David Bullock gives us this quote when talking about the toll the Russian war had on the people. Quote, no one 
has been able to calculate accurately the cost in human life attributable to the Civil War. Reasoned estimates have placed the number of dead from battle and diseased in the Red Army as low as 425,000 to as high as 1.213 million. Number for their opponents range from 325,000 to 1,287,000. Another 200 to 400,000 died in prison or were executed as a result of the Red Terror against the enemies of the people. A further 50,000 may have been victims of the corresponding White Terror. Another 5 million are believed to have died in the ensuing famines of 1921-22 directly caused by the economic disruption of revolution and civil war. The number of civilians succumbing to the epidemics of typhus, typhoid, and cholera in 1918 to 21, and to the Spanish influenza pandemic of 1918-19 can only be imagined. The final butcher's bill totals seven to 14 million. I want to repeat that last line. The final butcher's bill totals 7 to 14 million. By contrast, the American Civil War cost approximately 785,000 to 1 million deaths. Both are staggering numbers. But the Russian Civil War cost 7 to 14 times more lives. It's a very sobering number indeed. What is so utterly sad is that with the end of the war, the suffering of the people in the Soviet Union, Ukrainians, Russians, Georgians, Belarus, and others did not stop. Collectivization cost millions of lives. The Holodomor, the great genocidal famine of 1931-32, to 32, cost somewhere between 7 and 12 million additional lives. The great purge of the late 1930s would take millions more. Then the greatest loss of life would occur during World War II, the Great Patriotic War. An estimated 10 million Soviet soldiers died, with an additional 14 million civilians losing their lives. The number of lives destroyed between the Russian Revolution of 1917 until the end of World War II is almost incalculable. If we use conservative estimates, some 43 million men, women, and children died because of war, disease, and famine in the Soviet Union in a 28-year period, and the numbers can go up to 60 million. In, in my estimation, it's such a hard thing to wrap your head around. The suffering of the people of Russia, Ukraine, and all the countries around, starting with this revolution and the civil war, going through World War II. And it's with that heavy load that I leave you today. It's really sobering to think that so many suffered in the country my ancestors come from. May this tragedy never become reality again. Although, if history teaches us anything, it is unfortunately inevitable. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Join me next time as I restart the review of the Russian rulers with a look at the time of Catherine the Great. So now, as always, Das Vidanya e Spasiba Bolshoya.